Chapter 24, Matsya, the Lord's Fish Incarnation, verse number 50. Hmm. Achakshur andasya yata gagranim kritas. It's not up on the board yet, okay. Achakshur andasya yata grani kritas. <laughs> 
तथा जन स्वादुसौ बुरो गुरु तमाकृदृसम समीक समसनो ऋतु गुरु न स्वगति विभुक्षत अचाक्षर अंदस यत नाक्षरअंदसुसो बुरो गुरु मार्कदृत्सर्वृशम समीक्षणो वृथो गुरु न स्वागति बुभुक्षत अचाक्षुर अंदाग्रनीकृता तथा जन स्वादुसौ बुरो गुरु मार्कदृक्सर्वृशम समीक्षणो वृथो गुरु न स्वागति बुभुक्षत There's a few out there. Achaksu, <coughs> one who, achaksu, <laughs> one who does not have his power of sight, <laughs> and thus ya, for such a blind person, <laughs> yada, <coughs> as agrani, the leader, who goes first. <coughs> 
Krita. Accept it. Tata. Similarly, Janasya. Such a person. Avidusa. Who has no knowledge of the goal of life? <coughs> a Buddha, a foolish rascal. Guru, the spiritual master. Tvam, your lordship. Arkadrik, appear like the sun. <coughs> Sarvadrisam, of all sources, sources of knowledge. Samiksana, the complete seer, Rita, accepted, Guru, the spiritual master, Na, our, Swagatim, one who knows his real self-interest, Bubuksatam, such an enlightened person. <coughs> Translation, as a blind man being unable to see accepts another blind man as his leader, people who do not know the goal of life accept someone as guru who is a rascal and a fool. But we are interested in self-realization, therefore we accept you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as our spiritual master, for you are able to see in all directions and are omniscient like the sun. So Satyavrat Muni is continuing his prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Matsya. Purport. The conditioned soul, being wrapped in ignorance and therefore not knowing the goal of life, accepts the guru who can juggle words and make some display of magic. That is, a, that is wonderful to a fool. Sometimes a foolish person accepts someone as guru because he can manufacture a small quantity of gold by mystic yoga power. Because such a disciple has a poor fund of knowledge, he cannot judge whether the manufacture of gold is the criteria for a guru. Why should one not accept the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna from whom unlimited numbers of gold mines come into being? Aham sarvasya prabhavo matat sarvam pravartante. All the gold mines are created by the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, why should one accept a magician who can manufacture only a small portion of gold? Such gurus are accepted by those who are blind, not knowing the goal of life. Maharaj Satyavrat, however, knew the goal of life. He knew the Supreme Personality of Godhead and therefore he accepted the Lord as his guru. Either the Supreme Lord or his representative can become guru. The Lord says, Mamevaye papadyante mayam etam tarantite. One can get relief from the clutches of Maya as soon as one surrenders unto me. Therefore, it is the Guru's business to instruct his disciple to surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead if he wants relief from the material clutches. This is the symptom of the Guru. The same principle is instructed by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yari Deha Tarikaha Krishna Upadesh. In other words, one is advised not to accept the Guru who does not follow the path of instructions given by Lord Krishna. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvasesa sunyavari pastyatya de satarine, Vancha kalpa tarubhischa, kripa sindhu peevacha, patitanam bhavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasiri Gaur Bhaktavrinda, 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Mm. Now in this verse, there is both the bona fide guru and the person who accepts the position of a guru and who's not qualified to become one. Uh, of course, no one can accept, the, accept that position without order authorization, but those who do, they are unauthorized. In other words, they create their own ideas. <laughs> Prabhupada said no one can manufacture the process of devotional service, it's already done. He said if you just follow in the disciplic succession, then you get exactly what Krishna wants accordingly. Nothing is new, you just sim simply accept it, learn how to practice it, and then I would automatically, because the process is bona fide, you get the result. That is Krishna consciousness. It's already been given to us, and the bona fide spiritual master, in our case, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, has shown not only by his words, by his, by his personal example, what is the spiritual master, and how to follow a spiritual master. So everything is given to us. We don't have to create anything new. <laughs> and that's the problem with the Western culture, and now it's being spread everywhere. Do something new. <laughs> and the old way doesn't work, or the old way is just old-fashioned. Do something new. As Prabhupada said, walk on your hands, but whatever you do, change. <laughs> And this is the disease of the, the world today. Something new looks like something different. But all it is, is most of the time, is just imitations of the reality. And at the best, imitation is what it is. It's imitation. You can't get the benefit from imitation. You have to get the real thing. And there are so many persons in the name of guru, <laughs> And even the word itself has been extended to have different meanings. Like there's sports guru, there's, you know, rock and roll guru, and this guru, that guru. And they applied the word guru to different categories of life now. And somebody who's the best in that category is called guru. But actually the word means one who is weighty with knowledge. That is actually the terminology that applies to the word guru. One who knows the process of devotional service can teach the process of devotional service and also practices the process of devotions. In other words, that is called acharya. Acharya means one who not only speaks but is the example for what he speaks. And that, then you know that is a bona fide personality. And we have that within the life of Srila Prabhupada. He showed by example what it means to be a spiritual master. Not only did he give all the instructions, but he followed the process to the T. Although we know that someone who is very elevated can adjust things accordingly for their own practice, but in order to teach, he didn't do that. Generally, there was times he did, but generally just to teach, and that is the principle because it says, whatever great men do, common men follow in their footsteps, and then they set the standard. So Prabhupada taught the whole process. He chanted Hare Krishna also. He didn't just tell us to chant, and then he didn't chant. Sometimes the devotees would like to see what was Prabhupada's private life, Notice one little cute little story where Prabhupada was in his room with his door closed and it was one of these big French doors with a lot of ornamentations and a pretty big keyhole on the outside or in the door. And so the one person decided to look through the keyhole to see what Prabhupada was doing. <laughs> But he got a surprise. He saw an eye looking back <laughs> at him. You're watching me, but I'm watching you. <laughs> and Krishna is also watching you, so not just me. <laughs> so, yeah, 
Of course, there was other times where they did they did spy on Prabhupada to see what he was doing, and it was always do he was always chanting. when he was alone he was either translating, or he was chanting japa. <laughs> so Prabhupada was the ideal person who we could say yes, I want to follow this person because what he's teaching is what he's doing. <laughs> But then we have the other, and this is here, and Prabhupada takes some liberty in, <laughs> in making the translation for the verse. He, he puts the word rascal and fool in the translation. <laughs> and you can do that. So just to make a point that those who apparently present themselves as a spiritual man, just like somebody sent me a little video just a couple of days ago of this bogus guru. It was about... 30 second guru uh, thing. And he's just there, he's got a big beard and he's just laughing, that's all he does. And then the only thing he said was, all the religious books in the world are against me. <laughs> I said, I guess, yeah, I guess that would, yeah, as soon as they know who you are, everybody will be against you. <laughs> so I was thinking, yeah, who would be with you? Not even, you know, anybody with any sanity. So he was just a joker, you know, he was not really a guru. So you have a lot of that. But here, in the foundation for understanding, the essential point of a guru, a real guru, is that he talks about and teaches people to worship Krishna. That's the point. It's not that he's just very expert at, you know, speaking, or as Prabhupada uses the example, manufacturing some value metals. Whatever that one guru in South India. And he would do that in order to attract people. He could somehow or other twist his hand in different directions and all of a sudden there would be a piece of gold. And it's simply, it's, a, it's an art. You can learn that. It's actually... Krishna mentions it in the 11th canto. These are called mystic powers, manipulating the material energy. That's all it is. Prabhupada talks about when he was a young boy, uh, many persons who were, we call them sadhus or holy men or saints, they would be traveling, so they would come to a householder's house. And he said, my father, he was very accommodating. He would always allow them to come and he would host sometimes three or four at a time. He would give them a place to stay and some prasadam. So Prabhupada talks about one such person that he was talking with his father and he said to his father, just go in the next room and you will find a pomegranate leaf branch in the room. So he went in there and there was a branch from a pomegranate tree laying on the table with pomegranates on it. So that's called Prapti City. <laughs> that means they can get something from a distant place simply by the power of the mind. They can bring it to another place. So if someone can do that, especially nowadays when people don't know what a guru is, they say, oh wow, look at that. He must be God. <laughs> but. You know, so there, people are easily fooled because they want to be fooled. If you're looking for the real thing, Krishna will send it to you. And what is that real thing? You have to be interested in understanding, well, what is the purpose of life? As soon as you want to understand what is the purpose of life, and you're serious about that, and then Krishna will arrange for you to meet someone who can tell you what is actually the purpose of life. The purpose of life is to understand your relationship with the Supreme Lord. That is the purpose of life. There's no second purpose. Because all other purposes are simply based on the body, and we are not the body. And so whatever purposes we may create are simply to facilitate our uh, activities or our so-called happiness in this material world. But the real goal of life is Prema Pumartha Mahan. It's to develop your relationship with Krishna by serving Krishna's representative and understanding the goal of life, which is to develop love for Krishna. That's all. And Prabhupada said the process is easy. 
It's also eating, too, yeah. <laughs> That's part of the process. <laughs> uh, chanting, I was listening to Prabhupada this morning. Prabhupada said, it's so simple, he was talking. Just chanting Hare Krishna, dancing, eating nice food, and be happy. He said, that's it. <laughs> that's what Prabhupada said. <laughs> and I was thinking, maybe he left out something, but Prabhupada was, you know, just right to the point. Chanting, dancing, eating, and be happy. <laughs> that's all he said. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, maybe we should read some books too, <laughs> but, but Prabhupada didn't mention that. So, but his point was that the process has already been given. We don't have to create anything new. Just follow it and the button, it's, it's already there. You'll get the benefit, that's all. But then again, we have, you know, so many so-called persons who want to... Uh, there was one guru, I remember when I first joined the Hare Krishna movement back in 1972. I was in a place called Denver, Colorado. And I had met some people, and they, they somehow invited me to the temple. And so when I was there, there was another group of spiritualists. Their spiritual master was in trouble, so they came to the Hare Krishna movement to get some advice. And that was, what was his name? G. What's his name? Guruji. Guruji, yeah. <laughs> He was a young boy, he was from Rishikesh, and he came, and he used to dress up as Krishna. And he would have peacock feather in his hair, and he would wear yellow dhoti, and he'd carry a flute. <laughs> and so he had a following, you know, he was only 11 years old. So, I remember they were such in distress, there was a big scandal. Because his brother, who was a little bit older, he claimed that he was Krishna. So both of them claimed they were Krishna, and they were fighting. And so the mother was the, the supreme guru of both of them, so she was trying to somehow pacify. So the actual thing went back to India and went to court, and they were fighting. They wanted the judge or the court system to say, who is the real Krishna here? <laughs> And the judge was intelligent. He said, this is ridiculous. He threw the whole, threw the whole case out of court. <laughs> he didn't even want to hear it. The fact that it got to court is because it's India, you know. <laughs> you can expect things like that to happen. But yeah, they just threw it out. So when Prabhupada was instructed later, or not instructed, but advised who this person was, so Prabhupada said, hmm, he said three, he said, he said, we should kick on his face with boot. We should throw a pie in his face and we should pass urine in his face. The Prabhupada couldn't tolerate such persons because you have to understand Prabhupada is not being facetious or being what we say over anxious about these persons. When you love Krishna, when you have love for Krishna, and someone comes along and pretends to be Krishna, it gives you, it, it just disturbs you so much. The person you love is now being imitated by a fool. <laughs> and then it's just the, na the nature of love is you'll become upset. <laughs> You have to understand Prabhupada's heart. He's not just criticizing for the sake of criticism. You know, if you have someone you love deeply and somebody else is trying to imitate them, and, and how would you feel? You know, you think, you know, I have to just correct this person at least. So Prabhupada said these three things. And so one devotee, he thought, yeah, it's a nice instruction. So he... Uh, <laughs> This person, Guruji, was giving a public lecture and all of his followers were there. So this devotee sat in the front row. He managed to get the front row seat and he had a nice chocolate cream pie. <laughs> so when <laughs> Guruji made his, stay, uh, his uh, stance on stage and started to speak, the devotee got up and right in front of everybody 
smashed the pie in his face. <laughs> yeah, Prabhupada said, you know. <laughs> so, and <laughs> so then all of his followers got all, you know, anxious and they jumped on the person and the devotee and brought him into the back room and then they said, why did you do that? <laughs> And uh, the devotee said, well, if he was Krishna, why didn't he stop me? And then he said, well, that's his Leela. <laughs> that's his Leela. <laughs> to get hit in the face with a pie, that was his Leela. <laughs> so, you know, you can, author, you can authorize anything by saying anything. <laughs> so... So these are these are some person, and there are so many of these people around. You don't hear in India; it's just chock full of these persons. And sometimes they come to the West and look for some followers. There was this other person, uh, Rajneesh. Oh, he was really who. <laughs> he uh, he started this thing. He came from. He had such power. <clears throat> he had the power of. I don't know what that particular mystic power is, that when you speak, you can control people's minds completely. I don't know what the name of that mystic power is, but he had that power. And so when he would speak large, he was from Pune, Pune, and he was just speaking, speaking people, and he would, so many people would follow him. And then he was kind of like boasting how dearer he was, how undisturbed he was by anything in this world. He said, I can be alone with a beautiful girl and I will not be disturbed. So they decided to give him a test. <laughs> so, Hare Krishna, Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. So what they did was, they said, all right, you, we'll, we'll give you the test. He said, sure. So they put a beautiful girl with him alone in a hotel room overnight. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> he didn't chant Hare Krishna, that's for sure. <laughs> and so the next morning he came out and he said, I have realizations of really what is actually the goal of life now. <laughs> <laughs> you remember something about that one? Uh. And he was proclaiming that he put a, a, an article in, in the two Indian newspapers challenging any woman to have him fall down. Mm. So the most famous prosecutor in New Delhi came to Bombay to challenge him. <laughs> so they spent the night together, and the next day he, he wrote an article in the newspaper for the newspaper, Liberation Through Sex. Yeah, <laughs> that was his... Liberation through sex, and then he started this movement based on that. That uh, that here's the way you can actually reach higher consciousness. <laughs> and so many of his followers, and I remember I, w I met many of his followers. They look so morose, so morose. They had to sterilize the ladies and all that because they were having too many kids <laughs> within the society. Uh, so becoming what that was their guru's instruction. This is how you experience higher consciousness. <laughs> and so he, he was. I remember <clears throat> I was in, out on Sankirtan one day, and, and then because uh, he became popular in the U.S. and he was living in one, I think it was Oregon or something. He had twenty-six, ro no, thirty-two Rolls Royces. <laughs> Because some of the most richest persons, you know, they like the, hey, sex and guru, poo, wow, wow, this is far out. A guru who really knows the goal of life. <laughs> yeah, it was easy to follow, you know. We've been practicing this for now, and now we're getting it in a better form. <laughs> we're actually getting liberation at the same time. <laughs> and so... I remember he uh, he was very popular, and then uh, he had given a, a public lecture one night somewhere in America, and it was one newspaper in 
in um, the U.S. called USA Today. It was kind of newspaper that would have news from all over the country, you know, like important articles. It, was, it wasn't a local newspaper, it was like a national newspaper. So I, the next day I, I had a copy of that, and there he was, front page picture. On the, pay, on the front of the, co of the newspaper. And there was a little caption of what, what he had said in his lecture the night before. And he said, the greatest illusion to mankind is the idea of God. I remember getting so angry. <laughs> I was punching the newspaper. <laughs> I was so upset. And you know, the next day, he got deported. He got thrown out of the country. <laughs> yeah. He, somehow he was in Charlotte, North Carolina, I think he was, and he was doing something there, and he, some tax evasion thing. So they threw him out of the country and sent him back to Pune <laughs> so he can do his nonsense somewhere else. So yeah, this is these these gurus. So there's so many of them, and he's just one of many. But you know, with Prabhupada, we have no doubt. And those who follow Prabhupada, they're as good as Prabhupada in the sense that they are giving Prabhupada to others in the same way that Prabhupada wanted him to be given, and that is our movement. So. Any Prabhupada said anyone can become a guru, simply have to learn, have to know how to follow and repeat perfectly and develop understanding of what you're repeating, not simply just repeat like a parrot, but repeat and understand. And that understanding comes by practicing the knowledge. That is called vigyan or realized knowledge through the activities of devotional service. Yes, your Devi Prabhaktir. Gita Devi Tata Guru Tasyaita Kartita Yatra Prakasanata Mahatmanaha. So one who has an implicit faith, and that faith that's not broken under any circumstance, in both Guru and Krishna, all the imports of all Vedic knowledge can be is revealed in the heart of the person who has that level of realization. So Prabhupada said he wants each and every one of us, he said it, to become a spiritual master. That doesn't necessarily mean you take the position of having disciples. It could mean that, but it also means that by my guru, by my command, be guru, say, lay. In other words, preach Krishna conscious. Prabhupada said we can all, we all should become qualified to know the philosophy and to speak the philosophy and so we can the world is very much needed of this knowledge knowledge is power knowledge is freedom real knowledge transcendental knowledge is freedom because when you have knowledge you're free what is that knowledge jivar sarupai krishna nitya das that's the essence of knowledge just like we sing every day Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chite Te Koriya Akya Anakam Omino Manisa Jakudan Dilo Ye Janmi Janmi Prabhu Se Dibya Gyan Ride Prakasita Dib Gyan Transcendent. What is that Dib Gyan? Prabhupada said that Dib Gyan is you belong to Krishna. <laughs> that is the Dib Gyan. You are Krishna's part and parcel and your relationship with Krishna is to serve Krishna, and that is your identity. So that is divgyan, that is transcendental knowledge which is fixed and is never changeable. When you have that understanding, then you can develop fearlessness in the execution of devotional service. What is that fearlessness? Is that you know, I'm not this body, I'm Krishna's part and parcel, I'm serving Krishna, therefore Krishna is protecting me, and I'm actually awakening my relationship with Krishna through the process of devotional service. So, in essence, the, the guru teaches that. He doesn't. Te he may speak about other subject matters in order to support the main topics, but his ultimate principle is: you are Krishna's servant, and Krishna is the supreme personality of God. That's the essence of his teachings. 
Okay, so coming to the end. Any questions or comments? Yes, Marco. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, you know, even in our society, as small as Slovenia now, there are, there are a lot of talks going on about, uh, because some devotees, they, they accept a guru from, from a different, they say it seems, I mean, they are Vaishnavas, but still, sometimes I, I don't know how to react, because some devotees say he's bogus, and some devotees, they're, they say he's not, you know, and, and it's even... has to come into cyclic succession according to the four sampradayas. If he doesn't, then he's outside of the, the authority. The Shastras say these are the four sampradayas, and there's where you can find bhakti. In, in one of the four, one or all four of those sampradayas. If they don't come into cyclic succession in one or, or any of those four sampradayas, then you, you can say that they're not bona fide. Because <laughs> anybody can learn the scriptures. There are, there are scholars who know more scriptures than we do. <laughs> and they can even quote the scriptures. But that doesn't mean they're in, they're in a position to be you know, a teacher or a, a spiritual master. Spiritual master is empowered by Krishna to do the work. He's not somebody who just surreptitiously grabs a position because he has some knowledge or he had some dream last night. And in the dream, it was revealed to him he was an incarnation. <laughs> so it goes on like that. But the point is, they have to come into civil succession. Evaram parampara prakta eva raja seo vidu, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. So. Yeah, they, say that, they say that he does, but still, some say he does, some say he don't, so it's even... Well, you, there's a way to find out. Yeah. Yeah. Who is his spiritual master? <laughs> Maharaj, you wanted to say something? Well, that's the main thing, yeah. And so the guru, you, if, you, if you carefully understand the life of Prabhupada, he didn't glorify himself. He was always glorifying Krishna. He was always saying, you're Krishna Das. He wasn't saying that, you know, I, I've come to, because, you know, I've come here to somehow or other show you that I know so much about you know, spiritual life. No, he, he came to actually glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And what and Prabhupada, I was listening this morning, Prabhupada was saying, whatever people say about me is simply the credit of my spiritual master. What, what is my credit? He said, that's my good fortune and that I did not change anything. I gave it as I, I received it. So, if you're sincere, and you actually want to understand the process of spiritual ma uh, master, then you follow. But if you want, if you want something else, then you change things accordingly. Prabhupada didn't want to change anything; he wanted to present it as it is. That's why he called his Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, as it is, as Krishna intended it to be. <laughs> And you can see, by the example, how many people became devotees from Prabhupada's Gita, as opposed to all of the Gitas, all of the additions that have been out for, you know, decades. So who's, you know, who's actually following Bhagavad Gita? Who's actually, you know, becoming self-realized by, by following these other versions of Bhagavad Gita? Because each one of them is different. <laughs> So, yeah, there is a check and balance program, checks to see what is bona fide. Coming into cyclic succession, his main activity is to teach what Krishna has taught. That's a spiritual master. He doesn't have a business on the side where he makes some money and so he can, you know, retire after he gets 
enough disciples. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that. All of these things are what goes on in the name of spiritual teachers. You can see, and you check, just go back in our line of disciplic succession, you see all of the acharyas were the same way. They lived their lives simply around Krishna, that's all. Yes? When you read the next of devotion, it's the preliminary, preliminary chapter, eligibility for the pure devotional service, and Prabhupada right. gives three different levels of devotees. Uttama Adhikari eligibility, Madhyama Adhikari eligibility, and Kanisa Adhikari eligibility. And for Uttama Adhikari eligibility, which is more or less describing the liberated soul, there's many, many qualifications. Mm -hmm. Minimum. In other words, the minimum qualification to be an initiating guru, at least, is to be liberated. And that means that you have to have complete conviction that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, complete adherence to one's previous guru, right. ability to, to convince others about the absolute truth, mm -hmm, yeah. etc. So Brahmanishtam. Mm -hmm. So in that way, Prabhupada said, then being thoroughly trained by one's spiritual master, one is also eligible to take, become a spiritual master himself. Mm -hmm. And that's just the preliminary qualification to be guru, yeah, the again, minimum. It's to defeat all opposing arguments and establish the principles of, you know, Siddhant Dandarma as the conclusion here. Yeah. What is that verse from the 11th Kir Tasma, Guru Papadyante? Sabde Parad Nishnatman Brahma Upasrayasrayam. That verse really sums up. <laughs> What is the spiritual master? Hmm. Knows the scriptures, can teach the scriptures, and can defeat all opposing arguments like that. Comes in disciplic succession. So if this per these persons follow all of these criteria, then you can say they're bona fide. Because the relationships between devotees, you know, are checked because of this, because, the, because we don't know how to behave now amongst ourselves, because uh, I can see two devotees and they're arguing, you know, it's, their yeah. relationship is getting, is getting uh, weakened. Yeah, I know, there's, uh, there's been an upsurge of that in one area. <coughs> huh? Yeah. Where? In Rieka, right? Yeah, there's something going on there. <laughs> In any case, anyone who spends their time arguing about such things, they're not really made. First of all, we're trying to become devotees. We're trying to become eligible to become devotees. And if we waste our time arguing over such things, which is all right, you can argue based on Guru Sadhana and Shastra, but if it becomes envious or... If there's no conclusion to your arguments, yeah. Or just, yeah. In other words, Prabhupada said sometimes you may argue with someone, but if they don't accept the arguments, then it's a waste of time. Right. But in any case, if you argue and there's a, uh, there's a group there, and you try to use reason, reason and argument, and even if the person is not defeated, if there's an intelligent people in the group, right. they may understand more clearly what the actual arguments are. Right. So that's why we use the, that's why we challenge, yeah. Yeah. But in any case, just devotees arguing, I mean, this, without the basis of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. That's, you know, where do you go? Yeah. What do you use for an argument? <laughs> there's, there's three types of arguments. There's Vada, which is, and then there's, in Bhagavad Gita, I forget this, there's one where you just argue for the sake of arguing. Then there's argued for the sake of defeating someone. Dunda or something like yeah, that. Dunda is ar <laughs> that's Dunda. <laughs> defeating other then there's arguments to and actually establish one, what the truth is. And the other one is you Vada. just tear apart the other guy's character. <laughs> you don't even deal with the that's, philosophy. That's at Hanuman. I don't hone him in it. Something like that. Yeah, there's four kinds. 
for Well, there's many different fallacies and arguments, but there, in Bhagavad Gita, there may be four kinds, there may be more types of mistaken arguments, methods of arguing. Yeah. yeah. The best method of argument is you listen to what the other person says, and then you show where he's wrong. <laughs> if you want to defeat an argument, the best way is not to present your argument, tear apart the other person's argument. You can see two people, I, he's one saying this, the other one saying that, going back and forth. Tarka. Better just to listen to the other person, look for the mistakes in his argument, and challenge him based on those mistakes. That's all. <laughs> and then he, he can see he's wrong if you, if you know how to challenge him. Like that. You don't even give your own argument, you just defeat his argument. Tarko, apratishta, shudhya, vibhina, nasavri, shir yasyana vinam. Dharmasya tattvam nihitam guhayam Mahajano yena katasa panta Yeah, that is the following in the footsteps of the previous acharyas. That, yeah, once that is established, then... But nowadays it's so... It's actually quite difficult to understand who's bona fide and who's not. When someone is expert at argument and they have many good outstanding qualities like that but again if they're not in disciplic succession then mm -hmm. just like someone might say well i'm an incarnation well then where are you mentioned in the shastra because <laughs> all the incarnations are mentioned both past present and future <laughs> Yeah, so there's a way. That's why Prabhupada taught us all of these things so we wouldn't be fooled. Yeah, generally speaking, devotees get into arguments because they have nothing else to do. <laughs> they're, they're usually not, I mean, aspiring devotees. They're ger generally, they themselves aren't following very carefully and they, they're not really actively engaged in devotional service and sometimes simply out of whatever to for their yeah. own false ego or you yeah. know, to defend themselves, they get into arguments with others. Yeah. I but, remember I was at New York Rathiatra one time and it was this Ritvik group. So I was sitting there, I was standing in public talking to somebody and one guy comes up to me, hands me this magnus and he says, Marge, this is for you. <laughs> this way he said it, exactly like that. And immediately when I saw the cover, I just said, all right, Krishna, <laughs> I didn't take the magazine, I just kept talking to my friends. <laughs> and I didn't want to bother with him because it wasted time, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, in, now it's more, I guess it's more covert now. In the old day, in the early days, it was very overt. <laughs> Now I guess the over the over became covert because they didn't get any anywhere with being so public. Now they do it kind of behind the scenes and more or less in a sneaky way. Yeah, but anyway, it still goes on. Just like wherever you see real money, you'll know somewhere there's counterfeit. Wherever you see the real thing, there's always something, some imitation of that somewhere especially in spiritual life also. So therefore, read Prabhupada's books, listen to Srila Prabhupada, and try to understand that way we don't get become fooled by what goes on in the name of, you know, real religion. We have to know this. It's not something you just think, oh, it's okay. No. Because a lot of these people are expert at, at speaking. And as soon as you get your ear... They can convince you that what they're saying is right because of their way of speaking. That's where the danger comes. Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you. Oh, I have before we go, I have some Maha Prashadam for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada. Ki Jai.